Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this SRSE uh, video interview with Dave Rag. So Dave, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your books? Hello, I'm Dave Rag, the author of The Black Hawks and now the new book, The Righteous, which came out on the 10th of June. The books are from Harper Voyager and you should definitely buy them immediately. immediately. And immediately, they are, they are good. And uh, Dave was uh, with us at SRSE back in the before times, about 18 months ago, when we were able to meet in person in an actual pub and drink booze and uh, listen to people talk about books, which is a, a time I remember fondly and I hope we will have again. And, uh, and I, I particularly remember that night back in January because it was my first ever time doing uh, interviews for SRSE and Dave, who was up that night, and, and Jackie Marchant uh, were both very good with me as a, a newbie interviewer and um, when I was all new and nervous and it, it seemed to go okay, so much so that Dave's back and wanting to, to talk to us about, about book number two in his series. And um, we, were, we were kind of debating before this whether it was possible to do a reading from book two without massive spoilers for book one. And the answer is no. Um, book two picks up right where book one left off and as a result, does pretty much give away the ending of book one. Um, but all is not lost. I have done a separate video, which is uh, on the SRFC channel, of a reading from book one of a completely spoiler-free scene from somewhere in the middle. And I recommend you go and seek that out so you can see me and hear me doing the voices, which is not to be missed. No, it is It is good when authors do the voices. We, we like authors doing the voices. So yeah, do go and check out today's video. Go and check out the other videos as well. We've got over a hundred awesome uh, author videos. It's a real mix of stuff. There's some interviews, there's some readings, there are unboxings, there are shelfies, uh, there are hats. Uh, it's, it's a real interesting mixed bag. There will be something there that you will love, I promise. Um, but, but Dave, for, for those of us who, or for, for people who, who weren't there back in the before times of 18 months ago in January, 2020, um, or who are coming new to your work. Do you want to, to tell us a little bit about uh, your books? Because you know, we've got a complete series now, don't we? Yes, yes, we have indeed. It is a two book series, which my agent has begged me to stop calling a billogy. Uh, he prefers duology. I think that the terms are up for grabs. So the series is called Articles of Faith, which, um, if you believe me, is an immensely clever title for a number of reasons. Um, however, that's not important right now. They are works of extremely low fantasy based around a group of mercenaries, the titular Black Hawks or Black Hawk Company, and uh, a young man who is essentially their moral conscience. Um, it's his story. He goes from being a callow youth in a slight subversion of the sort of chosen farm boy narrative in that um, he is essentially useless in a fight. Um, and his character development is that he is useless at the beginning, useless in the middle, and by the end of the uh, series, he's useless. So what I like to think is consistency over development there. Um, the works are extremely low fantasy they take place in a sort of secondary world roughly analogous to 13th century caucasia um and it's full of swearing the whole and thing this, and this video just by the way <laughs> may contain some swearing because i think it's quite tricky to talk about the books in fact i've got a, a lovely <laughs> quote from lemon later which is is typically lemony and um full of swearing so so be warned if yes. swearing offends you, this is probably not the video for you. It's ironically what they call adult language, although it tends to be very childish, for which I apologise. Although clearly not that much. So, um, you're, so you've got the Black Hawks, your mercenary company. You've got your useless, useless main <laughs> character. What, what kicks off the story and, and, and what's the... Tell us a bit about the... Yes, the, the, the in, inciting incident. So book yeah. one is largely concerned with how our protagonist, Vedran Chell, who is, um, you can think of him as a sort of a school leaver in age. Uh, he has a lot of very firmly held notions as people in their late teens tend to. I mean, aspects of this obviously modelled on me, age 19. I think I'd pretty much worked the world out, knew, knew how it worked and uh, knew how it should be run. So with that mentality firmly in mind, um, he is roused from his sort of 
surly existence where he is uh, essentially a dog's body to his step uncle sent away from home various events take place they happen to him while he is present and he finds himself keeping the company of the kingdom's youngest prince who is probably the only person on the continent more pathetic and more self-pitying than he is um so far i'm making it sound pretty compelling aren't i um the two of them are then helped out slash kidnapped by the group of mercenaries and they find that obviously the world is not as they understood it things are very much more complicated both on a political level but uh, also on a sort of personal and, and moral level and the rest of the story is their adventures as they attempt to confront what they understand to be the greatest threats and uh that half of the story resolves itself in a way that is entirely consistent yes it does excellent we, we do like consistent story resolution yes and it's so it, it's kind of it feels a bit like comic grimdark reading it <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's not a comedy. I think it's important to say that. I know people say that the book is funny, but uh, and some, some people say that the the humor largely comes from the characters. The characters have a sense of humor, and the senses of humor of those characters vary wildly from Lemon, as you mentioned earlier, uh, to even the sort of the kind of nastiest, almost cynical characters. Everyone has an element of gallows humor because their situations are inherently so ridiculous and their chances of survival are pretty futile and if there's one thing we've learned from human experience over countless years of misery it's that people will make jokes at the most miserable times as a way of you know sort of psychic armor more than anything it's it's like the humor in the trenches in the first world war was extraordinary and that was not a particularly enjoyable experience. So I can't remember where the quote comes from, but anyone who said, if you produce a, a, a drama program for television that doesn't have jokes in it, then you're not doing drama because human beings are funny. People make jokes and these people make jokes most of the time at each other's expense. And the other half of it is that it, it's about their professional working relationships ultimately you know you're talking a group of freelancers existing in a perilous economy where it's very difficult to get clients to pay and it's very difficult to guarantee new work and the review sites are miserable no sorry that's another thing and you're forced to work with people who you don't necessarily have that good of relationship with and maybe not that high an opinion of but needs must and this is the situation the characters find themselves in and, and this is the sort of the humor that results it's essentially workplace humor uh, where the workplace is a pretty savage fantasy scenario and it's it's feels quite refreshing in because it's not something we actually we see a lot of in our fantasy fiction is established groups of people with existing relationships who will know each other you know your classic fantasy novel will have somebody making friends on their kind of quest journey yeah. you know and that that's part of their character growth and their bonding but here Chell gets dropped right in this really established group of people with history with tensions with grudges with fart jokes with in jokes with a huge amount of banter and is and he's trying to find he tries, kind of partly trying to find his place in there and with yeah. his his new rubbish prince but it yeah. it feels very very fully formed in a way that that we we don't often see well i i think that probably comes from my own sort of professional life as like a, a jobbing software developer you know having spent a decade or more doing projects of you know reasonably short period of time maybe a year or so with a group of different people is that i think i wanted to capture the sense for chell that he's the new guy you know, he's joining a group who already know each other. And it's not a great spoiler to say that even though he's trying to escape from them at the beginning, by the end, he's perhaps seeing the merit of maybe hanging around with them. Maybe. So that sense of sort of trying to work out who people are, who you are to them, who they can be to you, who you can trust, who's friendly, who is decidedly not friendly. 
and then find your own place within that team that sort of where do i fit and what what can i learn from them but what can i bring to this as well and that if anything is child's journey because it's too easy to say that you have this sort of naive character in the form of Chell, the sort of the, he's you know the closest thing to a sort of a reader's analog like the person who doesn't know about the world the naive who is there needs to be told about it by the characters i mean it's, it's a fairly standard literary device but the expectation would be that he as the wide-eyed innocent would then learn about the true workings of the world from the embittered cynics and and if it were a more sort of nihilistic story then yes he'd find out everything he knew was a lie and by the end of it he would just be a broken down miserable git that's not the case this is just as much about the effect he has on the other characters as it is about the effect that they have on him and i think that's really important and it also feels as as a pair of books quite quite counter to some of the other fiction we've seen because with the Black Hawks and with, with Chell and his prince, I mean, they kind of crash around a lot and they make a lot of messes. They make a lot of things worse and cause a lot of damage while they're trying to kind of very cat handedly try and do good. Yes, yes. There's quite a lot of sort of law of unintended consequences. I think one of the pieces of editing feedback that I got when uh, when book two was first sent over to, to the editors was um, they are allowed to have some things go right uh so if, believe it or not it was worse <laughs> in the original they they cause considerably more damage than they do in the fin uh, finished version because a lot of things kind of do hilariously go wrong there are a lot of those kind of unintended consequences there are lots of oops didn't mean for that to happen you know there aren't don't feel like there are very many well executed plans without something coming out of left field and then having to panic and improvise and there's a there is a lot of improvising Yes. And then and that, you know, they wouldn't have got as far as they had if they didn't have a, a base level of competence. And they are, I, I like to think that the characters, the prince notwithstanding, are genuinely good at their jobs. They are genuinely capable people who have been harried by circumstance, cornered to the extent that they are unpopular in the circles they would otherwise be riding in because they've been blamed for things that have gone wrong in the past they're considered essentially unlucky so nobody wants to work with them and although it's a, it's a relatively minor strain chell is andrees this is you know sort of throwaway trivia if you like but they are considered totemic by certain people they're supposed to be lucky to have around so there is an element of if we keep this kid around, maybe our luck will change to some of the thinking in there. And uh, you can, I mean, you, Carrie, you've, you've read to the end of the book, you can argue, did their luck get better or worse? <laughs> if he'd never joined up, would things have worked out better for them? It's, it's hard to know um, because, you know, trousers of time and all that notwithstanding. But um, I like to think that it's not their fault at least they can they can look on it and say we we've just been unfortunate a lot of the time a lot of the time that's not true but they can you know, they can assemble enough evidence to make themselves feel better and you know sometimes they've made it worse but you know, we, <laughs> we, we, we we don't talk about that and it's a it, it's a kind of a, a really lovely mixed group the the, the black hawks because you've kind of got rennick who's likes to think that he's in charge and, and is that kind of grizzled older veteran. Yeah. But but the tension between him and Lovelace, who is super competent and the kind of sparkiness between them, you've got Lemon, who is like your sweary best mate. And, and she, yes. is, she is, she is, she is great. I love Lemon. <laughs> Lemon, of all of them, Lemon is the one that I would want to go for a beer with. Yeah. And yes. you've got, you've got Whisper, who again is, incredibly competent but a lot quieter exists a lot in the shadows you've got spider who is horrible <laughs> but he's also really good at what he does and that, that, that feels like a workplace team these are not your friends yeah. this is people are valued for their professional expertise not yes. for not for you know how well you get on with them and, and a shared set of interests yep yep and you're yeah, not forgetting foss as well who is probably yes. the, the one person who I think I've, I've, I've done these sort of, you know, little questionnaires in the past and it's the kind of, if you could have any one member of, of the Black Hawks be your colleague for the day, who would it be? And I'd, I'd always pick Foss because I think he's the only one who wouldn't tease me. 
I, all the rest of them would just be merciless. Yeah. <laughs> Foss, is, Foss is really sweet. He's, he's just so lovely. Is, I mean, if, considering, like, well, obviously, I, I know all of their personal histories. I have a, mm. a, a giant document of, you know, where, where they've come from and even one of those sort of little timeline things of when they met. And uh, none of that's in the book. There's the, it's just, you're very much presented sort of in, in media res in terms of their uh, relationships. They're there. This is, they already know each other. We carry on from there kind of thing. Um, but they've all been through things. And Foss especially is on that sort of then upward slide of atonement, having more or less come to terms with being part of some awful stuff in the past and things that he's no longer proud of trying to make peace with that and that's sort of you know one of the things that's keeping him going which is why you can have somebody who isn't isn't an incredibly sweary murderous bastard hanging around with a group who pretty much are sweary drunk <laughs> murderous <laughs> bastards for the most part yes um, but it, um, uh, it, it, well, it, in terms of the drinking i mean that's that's something that you would think surely they they'd have learned their lesson you have to cut back on the amount of boozing you do every time the opportunity arises because inevitably bad things happen. And I believe the prince makes that point to them in one of the scenes they're in. He, he um, does. And I have Lemon's <laughs> reply here because I loved it and I highlighted it in my Kindle, which is because we have no idea what tomorrow brings. So we might as well face it with a granny fucker of a hangover. Which is, the, yeah, that's the, the exact counterpoint, you know, that, you you have to seek joy and, and as someone who has been through uh parenthood of small children where there's you know obviously children are joy of childbirth etc um there's not a lot to celebrate when your existence is sort of confined and you know pandemics and all that notwithstanding what i found was that if I could be drinking during some god awful kid based supervision activity, that made it, it fun. That meant it was fun. It didn't make it fun. It was never going to be fun. But if you're having like a warm can of cheap lager from the supermarket while watching your kid fall off a soft play, that means it's still your time. You're still in control. It's still fun. So there are elements of that in the book. If you're still able to drink and kid yourself, you're enjoying yourself then you're in control of your life. And even if that makes, you know, sure, we don't know what's coming tomorrow, but it's unlikely to be improved by the hangover. But that's not the point. The point is we're in control of ourselves right now. We have the choice to drink. We choose to drink. We choose to do this because it makes us feel we're in control. The irony being, of course, that they then tend to lose control as a result. And, and and there is a, a a kind of a running joke that in, in the book that that bad things always happen when they've been out on the lamb. Yes, yes. Any time they sit down to dinner with people, it goes terribly, terribly wrong. But that can't always be the case. Inevitably, there will come a time where that doesn't happen, and you know they'll just keep plugging their <laughs> plugging their way until it happens. Uh, it's. Um... Yeah, it feels like there's there's kind of two lessons that, that come out of, of this book. So the, the first one is no one is dead until you actually see the body. And, and the second one is you might as well get drunk, you know, even if it does usually uh, lead to yes. chaos. If the chance is there, always take the drink. Ease yes. it. I mean, that those are basically both pieces of advice from Lemon. Um, mm. Yes, yeah, she, she goes to great pains to spell them out. I think her advice in the first book is don't die. And yeah, her advice in the second book is uh, make sure other people are truly dead and always be drinking. <laughs> so I don't know why she's so popular with people. It, it does feel like she's kind of very much the, the, the kind of the, the, the comic and emotional heart of a lot of it. Yeah, I, I don't I can't really explain where Lemon came from in that she sort of exists fully formed in my head. And she is she's an amalgam of all kinds of things she, she performs incredibly important roles in terms of the group dynamic in terms of the storyline in terms of the dialogue she's sort of uh, this uh like nexus if you like of of a whole lot of overlapping responsibility which has created lemon and i 
I get I have me sort of picking apart in my head she's got the sort of the hair of Merida from Brave if you can imagine you know but she's obviously not a, a Disney princess I think there are elements of kind of Ewan McGregor in Black Hawk Down if you can remember I don't know if you ever saw it he plays a character called Grimes who is always complaining about everything which given the events of Black Hawk Down they all have plenty to complain about but he's in my head, he's the one complaining about the state of their instant coffee rather than, yeah. you know, the, the bullets coming through, that kind of thing. So there's all this, you know, she has to be Scottish because that's what the role demands. <laughs> so you have to create a sort of uh, a Celtic existence. You know, there has to be a, a group of people living in a sort of Celtic way to, to produce Lemon because Lemon has to be Scottish. She is in some ways... A fantasy dwarf like carries a lot of hammers uh prone to hitting stuff with the hammers that kind of thing it's just this is how she needs to be this is how she exists this is how she must be her relationship with foss the incredible sort of the mm. tightness the but the protectiveness all of that it's just i never had to think about any of it it's it was just there it's always been there and you know i i don't think i couldn't recreate it it's a bit like um oh what's that 80s film weird science where they accidentally create Kelly LeBrock using a, a Barbie and a bolt of lightning or something. It's that sort of whatever it was I did to create Lemon. I, I doubt I could do it again if, if you told me to. But um, there she is. And I am I'm immensely proud of her. I do consider her a personal friend. Oh, she is. She is amazing. I, I love her to bits. And um, just, just kind of looking down my notes, where should we go next? Okay, so it feels like and, and it's it's kind of particularly comes through quite a lot here in book two for those of you who have read book one it feels like it's quite a lot in book two about the the challenges of changing structures so there, there's a kind of a thing that just killing the figurehead <laughs> maybe that isn't enough that you kind of got the the systems exist independent of the figurehead she says trying very hard not to spoil things <laughs> and, and it's, it's a bit more complicated than than that well, I remember, um, no, I, just, I think it was uh, Robert Jackson Bennett who wrote the Divine Cities books. Uh, the first of that is City of Stairs. City of Stairs, City of Blades, City of Miracles. Uh, they're great books. I really, really like them. And one of the things that, that he said in reference to those is that whenever there's a disruptive movement, the status will do its best to reassert itself. And the pointier, <laughs> these are not his words, these are mine, but basically the pointier an, an individual movement or figure of figurehead of a movement is in disrupting the status quo, the more likely it is to be squished. So that's sort of the, the convulsions that follow any attempt to change entrenched systems will inevitably lead to decapitations figuratively potentially literally and understanding that it's it's not just enough to say i mean you can point at any number of of real world examples at the moment you know this institution has a number of issues about it uh for example is institutionally corrupt to just pick a phrase at random let's change the person in charge the problem is now solved is it even if that person has the best will in the world and you know you don't need to look very far for any number of public sector examples any number of private sector examples you know there's a culture there are power structures there are any number of people who have because these these places you know they are made up of people organizations are made of people which is something that gets i think forgotten by the kind of people who who plan uh what do they call it right sizing and that sort of thing like oh we've worked out if we get rid of all the employees we'll save loads of money hooray let's do that um organizations are made of people and when an organization has a certain way of doing things a culture for want of a uh, better term for it you have to invest a huge amount of leverage mm. to change it and that leverage can take many forms but we're talking fantasy stories so mostly swords um although in this case because it's sort of mid 13th century there aren't actually that many swords i don't know if, if you if you spotted that but largely it's spears axes things that don't require a huge amount of worked steel because it's quite hard to come by 
Um, anyone with a sword is someone worth paying attention to, unless it's a crap sword, in which case probably not. But when it comes then to how do you fix a systemic problem, um, yeah, you need to do better than just um, changing the name on the door. And um, the other thing I, I kind of spotted in, in book two is that there's, it feels like there's a lot in here about parents. <laughs> the, the the black hawks and and you know uh Chell and and prince Torfel. it feels like there's there's a lot of revelations about little bits about people's origins and parents and a lot of kind of questioning people's particularly Tarful and Chell, kind of questioning their their received worldview about where they've come from and, and yeah. their values and, and 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 stuff like that yeah i think it's it's a uh obviously it's a foundational thing in terms of the way we view our parents as children will be starkly different from how we see them when we are grown ourselves but now what was it oh, it was back to the future back to the future again sort of leaping culturally sideways um back to the future came from one of the screenwriters i think bob gale seeing a picture of his mum or dad when they were a teenager and having the thought like, would I have been friends with you? And the whole thing stemmed from there, the notion, you know, go back in time, meeting your parents when they're the same age as you are now and seeing it, would I have been friends with them or not, blah, 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 everything came from that. And the, the closest thing I had to that experience was some friends of my parents growing up who were adults, you know, there's a gulf between us. They were grown ups. they were ineffable, unassailable, blah, blah, blah. I, I could only really exist to them as a sort of tiny sort of orbiting satellite, these people, you know, but incomprehensible to me. And then I didn't see them for God knows 15 years or something, went away, grew up, went to university, moved to London, became an adult in my own right. And then in my twenties, uh, my dad was going, this is going to sound terribly, terribly privileged, but that's my existence. My dad was going on a skiing holiday with a friend of his who broke his knee or something awful. And suddenly there was a gap and he said, would you like to go skiing with me? And I, I have not been skiing. Well, I've been skiing like three times in the last 20 years. You don't, yeah. I went skiing then and I went on holiday with my dad and this couple who I had not seen for 15 years, 20 years. When I'd last seen them, ineffable, unassailable grown-ups. When I met them again, we were all adults and suddenly seeing them as people, not contemporaries, but normal people like me and you, where you could actually you oh. judge in the nicest possible way. They were no longer things that could not be understood. They were just people. And you saw the flaws, you saw the nature of them you saw the sort of the gaps and you saw the the worth and you know all of the sort of in the way that you would meet and anyone you get trapped in a tiny apartment with for a week you'll see where the edges bump against each other and i don't think you can ever get that amount of distance on a parent assuming you would maintaining contact the whole way through but in the case of the characters of the book they have very truncated relationships with their parents. So what is left is the childhood imagination, essentially that image they had of what their parent represented formed when they were infants and then carried through with nothing to replace it. So the dissonance then of having cold reality suddenly tipped all over your little mental image because no, no human being can live up to the image the child will have of them you know certainly not, not a parent in terms of you know my dad's bigger than your dad kind of thing but like we lionize our parents because we have to because mm -hmm. they are the adults that we know most of all and there is that terrible sense of sort of seeing your parents first of all as just people and then as old which is the sort of the thing that follows and then generally downhill from there as it tends to be for all of us he said without wishing to become excessively morbid but it's a very powerful and destabilizing moment and to have it normally for, for most of us it's a, something that happens over a period of time but for the characters in the books it it's happening in the course of a conversation <laughs> so yeah it's something that, that sort of plays on my mind and uh if there's something that bothers me then i want it to bother my characters 
which is another reason why Shell is in pain the whole time, because I have all kinds of chronic ailments. So <laughs> I quite like to invest my characters with um, various sort of aches and pains. Yeah, he gets a lot of physical punishment in these books. I do, I do feel for him. He has it coming. Yeah, to be fair, he does. <laughs> he does. He, he is an idiot, and, and he has earned every single one of those. Chat shit, get banged. I believe that's the, the universal law. Uh, if you're going to go around headbutting people, expect a broken nose. I yes. mean, <laughs> at its at its crudest. Uh, so, so at the end of the righteous, is this the end of the story for the for the Blackhawks? Because it's this, it's it's an ending. Um, it is. It is an ending. Yeah. Um. It is in many ways. It's actually more open than it was as I planned it. Um. I I was perfectly happy for that to be. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, boxed and ready but uh, there is the possibility of follow-ons and what nature they take and whether or not any materialize is, is well kind of out of my hands um, TBC I think we'd, we'd say generously uh, but I know what happens next uh, I know what happens over the sort of the the short term and over the longer term so, uh, you know, if there's tremendous interest, then obviously I can tell you. <laughs> Go buy Dave's book so we can find out what happens next. That's the subliminal message there. Yeah, it's... but in terms of, you know, I don't want to give people the sense that um, this is an unfinished series. It is. This is one story told in two parts. Admittedly, the second part's a little fatter than the other. But it's the story of Chell meeting the prince, meeting the Black Hawks, and the journey they go on together. The whole thing is essentially, again, giving myself too much credit. It's a subversion of the classic fantasy narrative of mm. the quest. You know, the the farm boy who meets the grizzled mentor character and finds out that his fate is to save the world, and they assemble a, a crew and they go on a journey to various places and they confront the face of true evil and they triumph. Now, so Carrie, you've read the books, you can see where it adheres to the pattern and where perhaps it takes a step to the side. <laughs> Um, but that's that is the story. By the end of it, he is changed. They are changed, and he's learned the lessons he needed to from the context of all of this. He's ready to face the next phase of his life, which may or may not be a gap year. And it's and it's they're a really fun bunch of people to spend time with and and to go on a murderous road trip with. Absolutely, yes. You know, meet <laughs> meet people and stab them. Um, and occasionally get stabbed because you've, you've done something up. to deserve it. Yes, absolutely. It does. It, it, it all gets quite explosive, um, like lemons downstairs. But, you know, we've, this, this is the nature of the journey we're on. It is. So what's it been like having a book launch during lockdown? Uh, well, I, I have to I have to credit my wife who um, we, when we launched the first one, we had a beautiful event at Goldsboro Books and, and uh, my perennial thanks to them and everyone who took part and organized that and everyone I'd ever met turned up and it was wonderful I had a wonderful time and that was great and that was October 2019 and when we released the second book nearly a month ago now it's today the eighth yeah so nearly a month ago uh we couldn't see anybody so <laughs> my wife got very excited though when she found somewhere online who would print merch so she got uh a whole lot of stuff printed. She got mugs printed. She got two beach towels made, one with each of the um, covers on them. She got a whole load of the little business cards printed up and made her own version of Cards Against Humanity called Black Hawks Against Humanity, complete with quotes from the book as the answers in there. It was every bit as tasteful as it sounds. And we had an enormous cake with the book cover on, and that, that cake lasted a week. It was huge. I mean, I should write shorter books, really, shouldn't I? Um, so she went above and beyond to create a true party atmosphere and that was all very lovely um, although it wasn't quite as good as actually going outside <laughs> so you know may maybe next time uh we will see um in terms of of the press again i have to thank all of the book bloggers and reviewers and everything who um fell over themselves to help because it's quite difficult to get people excited about a, a second book but um yeah, they were, you know, the Fantasy Hide, Fantasy In, Track of Words. Oh my God, I've got a big list somewhere. All of these guys really uh, pushed the boat out and, and 
got some press going in in the weeks up so we did get a bit of interest and uh people have been reading the book which is nice please read the book actually you don't have to read the book buy the book you don't have to read it buy the book put it on a shelf keep looking at it and go oh i must yeah uh, i can recommend that approach with many books i own uh looking at the size of my tbr pile uh, <laughs> buying books and reading books are definitely different hobbies yeah. <laughs> If, if I were a dragon, you know, that's what I would hoard. Forget gold, it will yeah. be books. I'm, yes. I'm kind of making a good start. Although, it, you know, I'd always said that my to be red pile was kind of like my planning for the apocalypse. And when that finally happened, yeah. you know, I, I would be there and would be sorted and I could just kind of lock my door and, and stay inside and read books. And lo yeah. and behold, that, that turned out. Although, mysteriously that turned out to be a plan except i wasn't expecting that i would lose a lot of reading mojo uh, because of the apocalypse but hey yes it's frustrating now. when you it spend your time saying things like i just need to be locked in my house for a year with nowhere to go and nothing to do and i'll finally get yeah well I, no. I still feel cheated that i haven't had six weeks on full pay to watch netflix <sighs> like my brother did and like it's just so unfair it's yeah. just unfair <laughs> how, how dare people expect me to work through all of this it's outrageous yeah <laughs> so what is next for you um then what what's coming up you've got well a un book series unfortunately yes name? i mean the, the answer is many different possibilities none of which i can talk about yet um it's it, it is the sort of the nature of publishing to be kind of cryptic and evasive but because i, I can't <laughs> confirm anything yet so I can tell you that there are multiple books that either will exist, do exist, in, or in a state of partial existence, and any number of them <laughs> could be advanced, or zero, uh, in which case I will become a shoe salesman. Uh, I won't. Hey. You, you you are in that kind of little schrodinger's um book publishing yes, limbo land at the moment i have i have schrodinger's follow-up novel um it is yeah it is many many possibilities but currently nothing uh, can be confirmed publicly well fingers fingers crossed for some yeah. news and um and, and as and when we are allowed to actually meet other human beings in person, indoors, in, in groups of more than six, who knows? We might be able to go back to the pub. We might be able to be back in the basement of the Star and Kings, of the Star of Kings, yeah. and seeing other human beings and, and talking about books and drinking beer. That would be amazing. Yes. I mean, it seems almost too much to hope for yet now, but um, I believe I it, it, it will come again. I, I don't know how I will cope when I'm allowed out again. It could go either one of two ways. I could either kind of go a little bit mad or I will just freeze because I've forgotten yeah. how it works and I don't yes. know how to talk other to people, people. Other people, other people, other people. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. just ask yourself, what would Lemon do? And then possibly don't do that. But no. Maybe something no, maybe a little not. lower down the scale. What would Foss do? That's a better question. Sit quietly in the corner and then gently fall asleep. That is that is a life lesson for for all of us, quite possibly. Oh yeah, that's a good thing. What, yeah. what would they all do? What would Renick do? Uh, he... Probably charge to the bar, make a big show of how he knows how to get served first, and then become increasingly furious when he is not served by the second or third, and then eventually start a fight with the person who he believes cut in front of him. That seems fair, and and Whisper yeah. would have just melted oh, whisper, away whisper would have gone in got drinks and reappeared again um loveless would have made the point of simply sliding in in front of rennick getting served immediately not buying him a drink getting one for everybody else and then yeah going straight back and spider would have brought his own or nicked it uh yeah spider would probably have taken a tray of drinks off somebody else and then um threatened them when they made an issue what a wonderful bunch of people huh. wouldn't you, you like to yes. know more about them <laughs> If you want to know more about them <laughs> by, by Dave's books they, they really are brilliant fun and um, if you like Joe Abercrombie if you like Nick Eames and, and that kind of style of writing um do as you as you heard that they're, they're really interesting though that they are fun people to spend time with but really interesting in the in the way that they play with genre conventions so what we will do is we will we will wrap up there um as, as you might have inferred, no firm plans yet for us to be able to meet back in person. But watch this space. As soon as there is something that we can tell you, we will. 
Uh, in the meantime, there are over 100 videos on our YouTube channel. Go and check them out. Uh, there are uh, some fantastic interviews that Magnus has done. Uh, there are some interviews that I've done. I won't, I won't call them fantastic, but there are interviews I've done. There's all sorts of interesting stuff on there. And as always, the person who behind the scenes makes all this stuff happen is Phil, who does uh, an absolute blinder of a job in, in organising all of this so people like me can, can stand up and make a tit of myself on stage and talk about books with, with authors, which uh, obviously I love. So do come, come and check out our, our videos. Fingers crossed at some point soon we will be able to go and have a beer in person and hopefully it will not go as badly wrong as it does with Black Hawks when they go out and get absolutely wankered. So uh, thank you everybody. Um, hopefully we'll get to see you soon and thank you Dave. It's been fantastic talking to you. Thank you for having me. Likewise. Goodbye everybody. Bye.